Good day. I'm Rob Litvak, Senior Vice President of the Wilson Center. I have the best job here, managing our fellows program, where I've gotten to meet thousands on the cutting edge of scholarship in their respective fields. Uh, as an avid Beatles fan, I was pretty excited when we beamed up across the universe to mark NASA's 50th uh, anniversary. Today, we'll hear from former Wilson Center fellow Nick Schmidl's account of another music fan's efforts to access and change the way we think about space travel as Lindbergh did for air travel. Uh, but Test Gods is about much more than just Richard Branson's dream of ferrying passengers to space. Nick tells the story of a modern day Chuck Yeager who has to navigate complicated advanced technologies, though the risks are the same. I, I found two anecdotes particularly interesting. In one account, Mark Stuckey finds himself flying to Bahrain to teach others how software works. In another, we learn that he had to fly test missions in between overflights of presumably adversary satellites. And my connection to space is mostly through the lens of weapon systems and how to secure them from bad actors. So I'm thrilled to see the other side, especially as competition in space gets more contested and crowded. It's no longer just a game for governments. The private sector now has access as it never has before. I hope Nick will give us a glimpse of what's the, to come. Nick writes for The New Yorker and is the author of To Live or to Perish Forever, Two Tumultuous Years in Pakistan. And I recall an amazing article he wrote for The New Yorker on uh, the raid that occurred 10 years ago uh, to um, find uh, Osama bin Laden in his, in his uh, 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 base in, in, in Pakistan. Uh, his work has appeared in the New, in New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, Slate, The Washington Post, and many others. Nick has been a National Magazine Award finalist, a two-time Livingston Award finalist, and a winner of Kurt Schuck Award. In addition to his Wilson Fellowship, he is a former fellow at the Institute of Current World Affairs, the New America Foundation, and a resident at Rockefeller Foundation's Bellagio Center. And in 2017, uh, Nick was a Ferris uh, professor of journalism at Princeton University. Uh, the book is Test Gods. Uh, it's a fantastic read. Uh, um, really can't put it down once you start it. Um, uh, so over to you, Nick, to tell us about the book and then to have a conversation with the director of our Science and Technology Innovation Program, uh, Meg King, who is leading a new effort at the center uh, to create a space policy Microsoft site, microsite, a one-stop shop for reporters and policymakers on why space matters, what we put up there, and how we can better protect them. So stay tuned for that. Uh, with no further ado from me, uh, over to Nick. Well, thanks for having me today, Rob. This is a, this is a pleasure and a delight. And I, um, I have very fond memories of spending those first few months after I started working on the book, after I got the book contract. And was trying to then figure out how do I how do I <laughs> wrestle all of this material that I'd collected over the four years that I was embedded with Virgin Galactic into some sort of coherent uh, uh, some sort of coherent story. And so I remember having that fabulous office that you all hooked me up with and and hosted me and and you know generosity of the center. And so so thank you for that and thanks for having me today. Um, I suppose what I think may I'm going to talk for a few minutes just about sort of how I got into the story, and then uh, we'll take some questions uh, and, and discuss this further with Meg. I think it's it's helpful. There are a couple of key dates. The first key date is is the day is one of is perhaps the pivotal day for Virgin Galactics. Um, well, the the pivotal day for Virgin Galactic up until late 2018, which is the day that I took an interest in the story. So let's rewind to October 31st, 2014. Mm -hmm. Virgin Galactic is on that morning preparing to fly its fourth supersonic um, uh, uh, powered flight, rocket powered flight test. They had flown three over the course of the past uh, two years. And on this day, and it's helpful right now to, to quickly digress and explain how Virgin Galactic's flight configuration works. They have a, most rocket companies in this space, SpaceX, Blue Origin, and, and the other aspiring companies use a, a vertical takeoff and landing system. Um, so, you know, they're traditional rockets, they, they shoot straight up, but the case of, of Blue Origin and, and SpaceX, they land also vertically, which is, you know, 
akin to watching someone drop a pencil from a rooftop and have it land on the eraser. I mean, it's a phenomenal thing to watch. But what Virgin Galactic does is different and is from my perspective as a storyteller, um, and, and as I'll explain a bit more as, as, as the son of a fighter pilot, is a bit more compelling. Which is that Virgin Galactic has a spaceship that they call Spaceship Two that is uh, attached, is, is, is mated to a mothership that's called the White Knight Two. And this is much the configuration that you saw in the, the mid 20th century with the X planes, the X1, the X15. And the mothership, White Knight Two, tows the spaceship up to about 45,000 feet drops the spaceship and the spaceship, uh, the, the two test pilots in the cockpit at the controls. Again, this is not an automated machine. These, these, are, these are, are, are real test pilots flying a real winged rocket ship. And so in a perfect world, they light that rocket motor, the spaceship flies horizontally for a few seconds and enters a near vertical uh, uh, ascent up to the heavens, right? So on this particular day on uh, the 30, October 31st, 2014, they were a few seconds into that burn when the, the, the rocket motor burn, when the co-pilot made this unimaginable and sort of unthinkable error. error. Um, sort of like uh, pulling the emergency brake going 100 miles an hour on the highway. He, he, he activated the, the feather, which, which folds the vehicle in half and helps it make a careful and controlled re-entry from space. But he did this as they were approaching Mach 1 and it shredded the vehicle apart in midair. And I remember getting the alert on my phone that day that Virgin Galactic had just that that their spaceship had just crashed and a test pilot had been killed and one test pilot and one pilot had been uh, uh, seriously injured. And I remembered sort of stopping and thinking, you know, I'm kind of trying to collect myself as to what the story was. And it was like, wait a second. So there is a privately run company owned by a swashbuckling British billionaire that is building, hand building uh, rocket ships in the middle of the desert that are being flown at supersonic speeds. Like this sounded crazy to me. A and someone had just died in the process of doing this. So, you know, at the New Yorker, I'm, you're, you're kind of, you're looking for that, what's that dramatic moment that you can begin sort of building a bigger story from. And so this seemed to me like the dramatic moment. I remember going to my editor and saying, what do you think about us writing about these, I mean, who are these test pilots, right? There was a photograph that we were looking at that day of um, four or five test pilots that were walking out to the spaceship uh, in the pre-dawn light. And it was, you know, we were staring at this photograph and just saying like, who, who are these guys? And so that was, the, that was the impetus, trying to figure out who are these people that are in the middle, of, in the, middle of, of, of the Mojave Desert doing this. And so the question that my editor asked was, can we get real access? And what he meant by that was, Richard Branson is very press savvy and, we were relatively confident that we could get into the hangar and we could get, you know, some sort of dog and pony show, but could we, I wanted to watch them work. I wanted to watch this company try to recover from this horrific accident, build another spaceship and return to rocket powered flight. And the idea, so that, that was the fourth powered flight that crashed that morning. I wanted to stay with the company until the fifth powered flight. I wanted to end on a concrete moment, not a moment like many stories that had been written about Virgin Galactic had ended previously, which was with a quote from Richard Branson saying, you know, tomorrow, hopefully tomorrow. We didn't, we didn't want, we needed, we didn't want to end with that sort of ambiguity and that, that, you know, it was a story of hope, but we didn't want to end on a, on a um, preordained hopeful note. So um, the company agreed. And at that point they thought that would, that, that period would take about 18 to 24 months. It ended up taking four years. And to the great credit of the, the staff at the New Yorker and, and, and the, the editors of the New Yorker, they decided this was a project worth reinvesting and reinvesting and reinvesting in and sent me to California. Uh, I made in total 15 trips to Mojave um, and one trip to the spaceport of America, New Mexico, and one trip to the center to a private centrifuge outside of Philadelphia with these guys. So I was I was I had this incredible embedded access to the company. And so I wrote a piece for the New Yorker that came out in August of 2018, and that ended with that that fifth uh, flight. And and then and then I started working on the book. And what I needed so there were there was when I was writing the magazine piece, I needed someone. Uh, um, I needed to find someone, a character, someone who could carry the story for me. There were so many. I had such great access that in some ways 
I would come back and I would sort of relay to my editors what I was seeing. And they were like, okay, this is great. You're a fly on the wall, but you've got to sort of, you know, tell us what we're seeing. And so around that time, very early in that, in that reporting, I met this test pilot named Mark Stuckey. And Mark Stuckey had lived this phenomenal, phenomenally interesting life where he had been chasing an astronaut dream for 40 or nearly 50 years at that point. Um, he recalls, he has this, one of his earliest memories is, is watching John Glenn's maiden uh, space flight, uh, orbital space flight in 1962. And his watching it on television, his father comes home that day and Mark says to his dad, and his dad is a college professor uh, and, and a conscientious objector, was a conscientious objector in World War II. And he says to his dad, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to be. I want to become an astronaut, right? Now, most fathers at that point would humor their children and say, whatever you want to do, son, you know, sky's the limit. Uh, Mark Stuckey's dad told him that it was an impossible dream because all astronauts came from the military and no son of his was ever going to serve in the military. And so when Mark told me that story, I immediately thought, okay, you know what, talk about, talk about obstacles from a really early age. And, and so like, like most uh, good young men, Mark ignored his father and went into the Marine Corps and then went, uh, applied to NASA several times, got very close to getting into the astronaut program, but not quite. Went into NASA as a test pilot, spent several years there, uh, left NASA eventually, went into the air, I mean, flew um, for United for a few years, sold mortgages for a few years. Uh, and then at the time of the Iraq war, he went into uh, the Air Force as a, he had been a reservist and he went into the Air Force uh, on active duty. Flies in the Air Force for several years, at which point he spends um, a few years, as you mentioned, uh, in, in one of, on the secret sites in Nevada, right? Um, working for one of these black programs in which he was very cagey about sort of what he was doing and what he was seeing. And that was potentially one of the hardest parts of reporting, trying to fill in this, this, um, uh, this period of his life in which he wouldn't talk about anything that was happening, but was very uh, central to his career. So he leaves the Air Force and he joins Scaled Composites, which is the, this boutique aviation firm that Virgin Galactic had contracted to build and test their spaceship. And Mark flew the first three successful powered flights did not fly the fourth in which his best friend was killed and was now um, preparing to fly the fifth. And so that was the sort of thrust of the, the, the magazine piece. Um, well, when I sat down to start writing the book, I was trying to figure out in some ways, I was trying to, I, I, I wanted the book both to go, I wanted more closure. I wanted to see Mark re fulfill his space dream. And of course, yeah, that was so, so that was, that was one, Ideal, ideal endpoint for the book. But I also wanted to go deeper and try and figure out what it was that kind of interrogate my own reasons for wanting to write this book and, and stay with the story for so long. And in the process of doing that, um, started wrestling with the legacy of my dad. Um, my dad had been Mark Stuckey's flight instructor when they were both young Marines in the early 80s in Yuma, Arizona. Um, and my dad had risen up the ranks and retired as a three-star Marine Corps general in charge of all of the aviation for the Marine Corps. And so part of the book uh, is, is, is this kind of digression into why I came to this, why I came to this project, what space flight, what, what kind of exploration and expanding the envelope and all of that means both at a, at a technical um, aviation aerodynamic uh, um, arena and also kind of at a personal at a, in a personal one and so I was fortunate enough to 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 be with Mark on the uh, the day that he became an astronaut in December of 2018 and I'll just just to end I'll, I'll share the story this is a uh, uh, gives a window into the relationship that we had and the kind of hopefully the intimacy of the storytelling um, that evening after the after the flight, uh, he called me and he said, you know, his wife and he were having dinner at a uh, at, at their sort of favorite steakhouse near the near their house. And I said, why don't you come and join us? So I get there and there's no, there's nowhere for me to sit at the bar. He says, OK, actually, we've got we've got better whiskey in my house. So why don't you just come to my house and we'll drink whiskey. So go to his house. He says, I've got this bottle that Cheryl bought me several years ago. I've been saving it for a really special day. And um, and. So he, he breaks it out and he asks me, how do I want it? 
And I said, you know, I haven't drank, I don't, I don't drink much whiskey, whatever you think. So he, he says, okay, let's, let, let's, uh, we'll, uh, we'll take shots. So he goes and gets this, this rack of shot glasses and the rack, all the shot glasses are embossed with the names of these classified squadrons in Nevada of all these, of all these, uh, you know, these air force, uh, units. And of course, you won't talk about any of them. And I'm thinking, oh man, this is my opportunity. I mean, you know, what's what does this one mean? What does this one do? What does this one do? He says, I'm not going to talk about any of that. We can drink out of the shot glasses, but I'm not going to talk about what's on the shot glasses. So he says to me, he says, he says, I'll pour. Well, you know, I think we are taking shots, not you know, drinking out of shot glasses. So he pours this this whiskey, and I, you know, we cheers. Big day for you. Boom, I take the shot and he looks at me and he says, wow, man, you're really into this, aren't you? And I said, well, what, what do you mean? He said, well, no, I just thought that we would, you know, take, we were supposed to sit from the shot glass, not take a shot of it. And then I went back to my hotel that night and I looked up this bottle of whiskey on the internet and I realized that it was $600 for the bottle of whiskey. I thought, oh my God, you probably think that I'm like this bumpkin. <laughs> and so, uh, but that was, you know, being able to celebrate that night with him was, was, was really special. And, and in some ways, you know, kind of tied the story together. And so uh, that's, that's kind of how I came to it. And that's what I saw in it. And um, yeah, you know, Meg, if you have questions, Robbie, yeah, yeah. Questions, I'd love, love to love to hear. Um, that's a perfect segue. Of course, a test God would have a $600 bottle of whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So let's start with that. Can you tell us more about the title? Where does it come from? And what does it mean to be a modern astronaut? I was struck by how different the story was for someone at this time. And I'd just love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, great. So um, the, the, test guide, the title Test Guides comes from, uh, so, this, so there was this side bet that Mark Stuckey had made uh, that, that captures thematically sort of captures the, the, the commercialization, the private commercial space industry uh, theme that runs through the book. So 2009, Mark Stuckey is at the annual Society uh, for Experimental Test Pilots Symposium uh, convention in, in Disneyland, which, you know, when I found out that all these test pilots convened at this hotel in Disneyland, I, I went uh, a couple of years ago to the convention. And yeah, I mean, half of them are military, half of them are civilian or, you know, former military that are now doing working for civilian companies. But, you know, these guys are in unit, they're like, you know, senior military officers in uniforms that are mingling with, uh, you know, sunburnt men in goofy hats with their kids. And it, yeah, it was, it was a bizarro scene. But in 2009, Mark's there with one of his uh, Air Force um, um, uh, test, uh, uh, one of his students at the test pilot school uh, at Edwards Air Force Base, a guy named Jack Fisher. And Fisher had been selected to be an astronaut. And they had a friend named uh, uh, Hooter Rainey, Hooter's his call sign. And uh, Hooter says to them, you all should bet as to who's going to get to space first. He sort of prompts this bet. And they said, all right, you know, so Stucky, is Stucky going to get there with Virgin Galactic or is Fisher going to get there with NASA? And so fast forward, and the, oh, sorry, and the bet was the, the loser had to buy the other one dinner at Domingo's, which is a uh, Tex-Mex restaurant right outside the main gate at Edwards Air Force Base, kind of like the, the very the storied Poncho's uh, pub in, in The Right Stuff, right? I mean, it's that, it has that sort of uh, aura about it. And so the loser had to buy the other one dinner at, at Domingo's. So fast forward in 2017, Fisher gets to space first. And um, so I go to the dinner that they had in January of what was it? So Stucky goes to space in, in December of 18. And then there's a dinner in January of 19 at Domingo's. And this is Stucky's, okay, you know, I, I repay my debts. So they, uh, <laughs> I think the two of them sort of initially thought it was going to be them and a couple of small friends. Well, you know, these guys are legends in the community. And so before they know it, they rented out half the restaurant and there are like 30 test pilots and there are some of their wives as well packed into this, into this restaurant. And Stucky gets up there to start talking and Fisher gets up next to him and they're holding their margarita glasses aloft and, and Scooter Rainey in the back of the room says about Stucky when he stands up, he says, that's the Chuck Yeager of our generation. And then Fisher stands up next to him and he says, test gods. It's sort of to, it's just a comment on the stature in that room. And I thought immediately, all right, that's my, that, that's my title, right? I mean, these guys, when this notion of the right stuff and sort of having it and, and you know, who does and doesn't have it, it's, it's, it's sort of ever present, even as you continue to move up the elite 
ranks in this community. And, and, and as you continue to move up the elite ranks in any high performing um, subcult, you know, sort of, uh, you know, whether you're, an, you're, whether you're a star athlete or whether you're a star test pilot, you're always wondering if you can prove that you're the best, right? And so that's, that's, where the, the, that's, where the test, that's where the test gods comes from. Interestingly, kind of almost counterfactual to that, the, the modern astronaut, what I found so modern about the portrait of Mark Stuckey that uh, I, I set out to write was that the astronauts that we have read about and that we have known for the past 50 years have been men with primarily white men with set jaws and um, sort of peerless personalities. They may be quirky, they may be reserved, but we don't know very much about their personal lives. We don't know what they, we don't know what they fear. We don't know what they, what concerns them, what worries them, what nags at them. And so Mark Stuckey's willingness to let me into that side of his life and to share with me, um, you know, very sort of personal details about his divorce from his, his her first wife and his estrangement from his children for several years and rivalries with other pilots and frustrations along the way it just made him seem, um, I mean, we talk, we talk about sort of oversharing in this world, but like he was so willing to share and that to me made him um, feel distinctly unique from any other portrait of, of, of a test pilot or of an astronaut that I'd ever read. And so that's where that's where the, the, the modern application came from. I love it. The right stuff is required watching in my family. And as soon as your book becomes a movie, it will be too. So, <laughs> nice. um, so, so you mentioned so SpaceX and Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic were all founded kind of around the same period in the early 2000s. All kind of had rough starts, as you mentioned in their book. But many of them in SpaceX, as you've also mentioned, is doing really well. Um, yeah. So, so what are we at an inflection point towards space exploration? And, and tell us a bit about, you've just written about this, tell us a bit about how Virgin Galactic might or might not make a business out of this. You've got a recent essay in the, in the Times that, that unpacks this a bit. Yeah, I, I certainly think we're at an inflection point. I mean, yesterday, right? Yesterday, Blue Origin announces that it's going to begin finally and officially accepting reservations for seats on its uh, suborbital space tourism rocket. Uh, last night, uh, my time, uh, yesterday, also SpaceX uh, tests successfully uh, test and lands its Starship rocket. Um, the day before, SpaceX launched a bunch of satellites into space. I mean, the pace, the launch pace is astounding, right? I mean, it is, it is, it's one of those things where like, if you're not keeping track of it, if you, if you tuned out for a couple of weeks, uh, the, the volume of significant space related news is, um, is, 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 is overwhelming. Um, not all of these companies are clearly going to make it. And so Virgin Galactic and its sort of viability, you know, it's interesting Virgin Galactic in 2000, the, there's another inflection point in 2004 and in 2004, uh, there had been in 1996, there was a contest that was uh, started and the contest was called the X Prize. It was going to give $10 million to the first privately built, the first company or, or group of people that could build a privately funded spaceship to make it to fly to space twice within two weeks. And in 2004, this boutique aviation firm based in Mojave, California called Scaled Composites won the X Prize by flying Spaceship One to space twice uh, in, in uh, late September and early October of 2004. And Richard Branson, being the very savvy businessman that he, that he is, um, uh, licensed Spaceship One, or sort of you know, developed a relationship, uh, carved out a deal with Paul Allen, who was funding, funding uh, Spaceship One, to license it, to put a Virgin sticker on the, on the outside of, of Spaceship One, and to earn the right to build a bigger version of Spaceship One for his, at that point, uh, uh, new space company, Virgin Galactic. So in 2004, Virgin Galactic has a prototype that they're going to build and they're going to make into a bigger version uh, that can hold six tourists and fly two test pilots and, and make this, make this suborbital trip on a regular basis. So they come out of the gates really strong. What they 
realized and what they have realized over the course of the previous 17 years is that scaling propulsion is a lot more difficult than one would imagine. You know, it's not, this is not taking a, a small box car and making it a little bit bigger. Um, and it's just, it's been, they found it very, very, very difficult. Part of the reason is that the unique configuration, um, their, their air launch system is from my perspective, incredibly compelling um, as, as sort of, uh, uh, fodder for, for narrative nonfiction is for storytelling because you have a pilot sort of at the, you have so many humans that are in the loop. The, the, the human factor is central to the whole philosophy at Virgin Galactic. Uh, these other companies are run by folks who made their money in the tech world. And there is this belief, I think, at, I mean, there is, there is inherently this belief at SpaceX and at Blue Origin that the that you can sort of you can you can you can um you can program your way through human fallibility and at and and virgin galactic with richard branson at the helm with this very kind of um you know he's a he's a he's a adventurer of yesteryear he's 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 old school in that sense and he has always been fascinated with the romanticism the romance of you know having this the the these test pilots with the scarf flopping flying in the breeze flying these rocket ships and in it, all of that is true, but it makes it um, your your the opportunities for things to go wrong are multiplied uh, by 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 are multiplied numerous times because both the configuration because there's so many other flight services compared to just a single sort of uh, pencil going up and down, and also because people have occasionally bad days, which is what happened in 2014 with the, with the test pilot. So, Virgin Galactic has in some ways given up its lead in, in this suborbital space tourism race. That's not to say that they won't be able to make a go of it. I still, I think they could, they could fly to space more times, several more times. I think they could, I think they could do what they set out to do, but I don't think that they will be able to achieve what their financial uh, statements to, to have, you know, so they are now a publicly traded company and they're, you know, there are financial statements that suggest that, you know, by next year or the year after they'll be flying, you know, weekly space flights. I just don't see how that, I don't see how they sort of square that circle. Makes sense. So, so space travel, which you did mention, um, it's expensive. Training is required has traditionally been uh, a military dominated field. Do you think commercial space flight will ever really challenge the military's dominance? Or will there just be this kind of, you know, commercial sector more interested in, in putting assets in space and every once in a while putting people up in space? How, how do you think that ratio will, will work out? Well, I guess the question is like, what would, you know, challenging its dominance, what would that, I see your question, but I wonder, you know, like, do I think that SpaceX or Blue Origin will be weaponizing, um, I, I, you know, will be sort of weaponizing its rockets? I don't, I don't, I don't see that necessarily, but you know, I was struck by, I, I spent one day at SpaceX and I was struck when I sat there in the lobby, um, watching sort of who was coming in and out of the front door and the number of people coming in and not coming in and signing in as guests, but coming in with, with pass with badges, uh, in, in, military uniform and badging their way in, in and out of the, in and out of the, uh, um, uh, the SpaceX headquarters, I thought was really interesting. And, and I thought it was interesting because it, it showed me the extent to which um, there is clearly a uh, um, cooperation going on between the military, national, various national security uh, agencies and SpaceX. And, you know, I know at Virgin Galactic, they were trying to, um, uh, they were they were talking at one point with the the uh, chief of staff of the air force about what kind of capability they might be able to offer that would be able you know if virgin galactic can wrestle this suborbital capability into place you know the idea was look we could we could drop a jsoc unit um you know any special operations unit anywhere in the world um from you know taking off from from any some from some runway in the united states we could drop them anywhere in the world in three or four hours and not have to be forward based all over the place so i think that that i see the cooperation more than i see the 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 challenging i also think that um 
what a satellite is capable of doing, you know, this is, this is getting into science fiction a little bit, or, or, you know, in my mind, science fiction, maybe uh, if, if we were, you know, we, th this may not be science fiction in, in the dark sort of uh, um, uh, classified uh, chambers of, of various national security agencies, but the notion that like you could put a, uh, that SpaceX could be carrying, is carrying classified payloads that have offensive capabilities into space I don't see why that you know, that doesn't that doesn't um, that was doesn't stretch belief at all. I don't think. Um, I, I I agree with you. And the recent news at LA Air Force Base has been selected as the Space Forces Space Systems Command is um, more example that I agree with you that that collaboration is is probably more likely than competition. So yeah. I, it will be an interesting thing to watch. So um, we saw how in your book well that you described a software glitch during one of Stucky's test flights. It caused the gyros to flip, leaving him inverted in space and in dangerous territory. Um, apparently, Virgin engineers decided to ignore the glitch. They found it before the flight, um, but they didn't patch it because they didn't think it was critical at the time. Um, this, for the Wilson Center, who works a lot on, on cybersecurity issues, who helps brief and train congressional and executive branch staff about this challenge, particularly um, the future challenge cyber threats will pose to um, our assets in space. How do you think about this particular incident? I was interested that you included it. So just can you tell us a little bit about how um, these companies are thinking about cyber threats in space or are they? And, and just kind of reflecting on, on, on how that might um, change. Yeah. Let me talk first about the specifics of the incident and then we can talk about the cyber threats in space uh, after. So. So yes, yeah, so on the eve of the April 2018 powered flight, which was going to be their first one since the crash, the first supersonic test flight since the crash, they uh, the company that um, that builds the the gyroscopes that go in the in the spaceship uh, informed them that they had a software update, and now. We all know that you know you're in the middle of working on something, and you get a software update from Microsoft, and the last thing you want to do is somehow do something that's going to screw up, you know, whatever whatever Word file you're working on. So you know, most of us, at least I, most of the time, I'm like, ignore, I'll deal with that later. And and this is very much this is this is essentially what they did. They said um, the, the the software update came through and said it was a non. It didn't seem they looked at what the update was supposed to cover. It didn't seem critical. And they decided that they would uh, just wait until after the flight. They didn't want to sort of add another potential bug into uh, into the system so close to flying. So they go up, they fly that day, and um, suddenly they are, you know, the spaceship has had some lateral directional instability problems, which means that um, it, it, it wants to roll and it wants to yaw as it approaches Mach, um, uh, Mach 2. And so in this case, they were, they were, I guess they were upside down, um, sort of going to like, you know, at this near vertical ascent upside down, but the gyroscopes show that they were right side up. And only when, <laughs> only when they looked outside and they could see down on the earth, instead of looking up at space where they, you know, where they're like, oh crap, this, <laughs> this is not what we're supposed to be looking at. And at that point they realized that the gyros had flipped and, um, so they come down and they realize that the the software update had uh, that's what it was supposed to cover. You know, the the gyros flipping was one of the fine print things that that it was that the update was supposed to cover. You know, I think that um, in in retrospect, if they thought about it, I don't know that they actually would have done it. I, it it's curious. I, they didn't seem overly concerned about it. It's one of those. You know, it, it wasn't critical if they would have known in advance that this could happen i think it might have helped alleviate some of their confusion uh stucky's confusion in particular as he's up there at you know what would have been eighty thousand feet wondering why suddenly he's looking at something he's not supposed to be looking at um but so that was that specific episode the the question of kind of the cyber threats in space um you know i've written a little bit about cyber uh, and, and kind of private companies that are engaged in what have traditionally been government activities of, of uh, you know, um, uh, kind of counter hacking, hacking back, et cetera. Um, and I've written now this book about space, but I haven't really sort of looked at them uh, together. And so, I mean, your expertise actually would far exceed mine in this realm. So I would be curious to know sort of, yeah, how you think co these companies 
are or are not looking at it, um, you know, at this concern? Well, I think it's interesting the way you describe the difference between Virgin Galactic and the other, if you will, tech companies who by nature kind of think about software. Uh, and, and so we've heard more from those companies because I think they're used to it about how they're thinking about it. We've heard very little from Virgin Galactic, but broadly um, there's, there's interest in this area um, because it's one of those higher consequence but lower probability challenges right now. Uh, but we're going to need to think about it uh, going forward as more and more assets are sent up to space and there aren't clear guidelines for how they should be secured. I mean, we're talking about, you know, SpaceX is putting up Starlink to give more access to the Internet. Uh, you know, how, how will that compare to other companies that are along the chain that either help them or are connected to them or are totally separate and accessing some of these assets? So it's something to keep an eye on. Yeah. I'd love to hear a little bit more about the personal stories about Rooster, about your dad and about Stucky. Can you just tell us more and you get there in the middle of the book, it's spoiler alert, it's, it's this neat connection between your life and this amazing story you're trying to tell. So tell us a bit about what it was like to grow up in that kind of an environment and how that informed the way you told the story. Yeah. Um... So oftentimes, you know, when Stucky and I would oftentimes talk on his drive into work, uh, he had a 45 minute commute and he would, you know, and he made the commute at like 515 in the morning or some God awful time. And so, you know, I was on the East coast at 815. So I would oftentimes, you know, drop off my kids at school and then come back and hop on the phone with him for 45 minutes. And I can't tell you how many times, uh, I would hear, I could hear suddenly his engine, you know, that he had turned off the engine. He was sitting in the parking lot uh, at outside of the, the um, Faith. This, Faith is the name of the Virgin Galactic hangar for uh, final um, assembly and integration test hangar, I think. Um, and so he would, you know, he'd be parked out there and I could hear his engine turn off. And, and I knew that he was just sitting in his car talking to me. And oftentimes it was because he was kind of trying to explain or justify some behavior that I think he felt like he needed to justify. For instance, this one time uh, the, he, he broke his back in 2018 in a paragliding accident. Um, and his wife had, he also has, has co-authored a book about paragliding. He's, he's, a, he's an avid fanatic paraglider. And his wife had, first wife had said to him, it's, you, you, gotta, you gotta stop paragliding. You know, she had been to her, to her in her telling had been extremely supportive of him uh, over the previous several, you know, I think they were married for more than 20 years. Um, and, you know, the first thing that he, I guess, said to her when they first met, she was a few years older, when they first met, and he was a young Marine. Um, they met at some bar in Washington, D.C. And she tells the story. She says, you know, here's this, you know, very baby faced guy on the dance floor. And he's telling me he's going to become an astronaut one day. And she's going, oh, that's really cute. Right. And so, so she had, she tells him like, look, you got to stop flying the paraglider. You're, you, you're, you're, you're going to get hurt and it's going to affect your ability to become an astronaut. And so he flies it, he breaks his back. Uh, he's in, you know, a full body cast, essentially in the basement for months on end. And she says, it's either me or the paraglider. And, and he chose, he chose the paraglider. And as he was telling me this, he's sort of explaining to me and justifying to me in some ways, his, his, his love for flight. And I said, I said, you know, you don't, you don't need, like, I understand. And the reason why I understand is that, so when I first met him, I, I almost instantly kind of knew the type, right? And the type was that my dad, uh, while he was in uniform, was racing motorcycles on the weekends uh, and had a motorcycle and was, would periodically crash the motorcycle and would come home from the racetrack injured or, uh, you know, with his arm in a sling. And my mom would say, all right, all right, that's, that's, that's enough. Like we're, we're done with this. We're done with this weekend hobby. And my dad would say, okay, you know, you're probably right. You know, he was, you know, in his fifties. Okay. You're probably right. I mean, I'm racing against guys who don't have day jobs who, you know, have ponytails flopping out of the back of their helmets. And here I am, you know, expected to show up and to brief the joint chiefs of staff, you know, in, in, you know, 14 hours on the, the next morning. So, so he would have constantly say like, all right, I'm done. And then the bones would heal the ego would heal and he'd be back out there again. And so it's what I said to Stucky. I was like, look, I, I, I understand. So in some ways I always knew 
that my ability to write about Stucky was enhanced by my familiarity with with his character. You know, they they both, he and my dad both went to Top Gun. They kind of went to the same schools. They knew the same people. Um, but but what I what I wanted to 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 write about though was also from almost the perspective of, of Stucky's son, who had this very tried relationship with his dad. And, um, you know, it was living in the shadow of these men who do these extraordinary things, but are not necessarily the most present fathers. And I thought about this a lot because I thought about like, you know, my dad and I grew up, I always knew that he had set this standard that we could do anything that, you know, there was always, there was, I was always getting talks about, you know, he's always giving me books about, you know, Zen and the art of snowboarding or, um, you know, I, all these books. And I was like 12 and knew I was getting books on mental toughness and things like that. I mean, this, this is very much kind of inculcated in, into a, and I was like, you know what, actually I'm not mentally tough. Okay. <laughs> and so it was, uh, it was, it was just trying to, to, and I keep kind of coming back to the word reckoning, but it was just, just trying to figure out like what that childhood, was that an exceptional child? I never really thought about it. What, what, what did that, what did that type of, of um, fatherhood mean? And, and, you know, and because I am much more present and, and the reason why it came back is because I'm much more veil. I'm around my kids. Uh, I'm, I'm not deployed. My dad would go off, you know, he would deploy for, you know, six months at a time. Um, he was in the Gulf War for nine months. He was in Bosnia for four or five months. Uh, you know, he was gone for long stretches. And when he was home, you know, he was, he was often like in his own world. And, um, and so I've asked myself like, okay, I'm around more for my kids, but am I setting that? Am I, do I seem what, am, am I doing something that seems so sort of out of reach that I'm also, uh, uh, building a sense of them to want to sort of look higher and, and push themselves and stretch themselves. And that's, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have a great answer for that, but that's, um, that, that dual role of a, of a, of a, of a father to both inspire and to, uh, you know, to be available are, 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 you know, two, two aspects of fatherhood that, that I think this story gave me an opportunity to kind of meditate and think about. Um, yes, as the daughter of an Air Force colonel, I am very familiar with that kind of a childhood. Um, so uh, it resonated a lot with me too. Um, so can you tell us a bit more about some of the other characters? So Stucky's obviously the main character, but you mentioned for such a long time. And beyond just, you know, the, the terrible crash you mentioned, there were other horrific accidents that they endured. So can you tell us a little bit about the other characters and, um, and what it was like to, to talk to them and to learn about them? Because they weren't all the test gods, right? Yeah. They're the ones right. that made the test gods. Yeah. Um, I mean, so there, there, are a few, there are a few characters. There, there's the president of the company, the current president of the company. Um, well, well, so there are, so, let me give you a quick snapshot of a few. There's, there's Bert Rattan is central to this whole, this whole uh, enterprise. And, and Bert Rattan, anyone who's gone to the Air and Space Museum uh, should know Bert Rattan, even if they don't know Bert Rattan, because Bert Rattan has more aircraft on display in the Air and Space Museum than any other, aeros than any other uh, 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 engineer. Yes, I think it's six airplanes that have been displayed at theirs various times. And they call there, there was an article, a magazine article a few years ago that called him the, the magician of Mojave. And so he is this, you know, long mutton chops, and he's the one who, who designed Spaceship One. And this is his company, Scaled Composites. I spent a lot of time with him. I went up with Stucky. I went up and visited him uh, at his, his retirement home um, in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And I mean, that was a wild experience. I, I, Stucky sort of invited me. Stucky was going up there already and said, Hey, can Nick go? Can Nick come up? And this was for me, uh, like, you know, tagging along with Luke Skywalker when he goes to visit Yoga uh, Yoda at the Dagobah Swamp, right? I mean, to be able to sort of go and sit with these two guys. So we actually went uh, to watch First Man. It had just come out, and so we're sitting in the movie theater, and it's you know Stucky on one side and Rattan on the other side, and. Uh, 
uh, you know, there are a few other people in the theater, and but but Bert Rutan is, you know, he's probably in his uh, late seventies at this point, and you know, he's he's you know, he just he was just talking through the movie and all this, and I could tell I was like, oh man, if I'm in this movie theater right now and I'm trying to watch this movie and there's this guy in the front row that won't stop talking, I'm gonna be annoyed. But on the other hand, you know, Bert here's Bert Rutan who uh, is the engineer who built at this uh, this was uh, uh, November of two thousand and. Um, 18. At that point, Rutan was the last engineer to have built a human, a, a crewed spacecraft, and Stucky is most likely to become the next astronaut. And I thought, if, if the people in this in this movie theater knew sort of who was who was sharing the theater with them, they wouldn't mind that these two wouldn't stop talking. So, uh, so yeah. So Bert Rutan is is a, is a fascinating kind of intellectual thread through this. Uh, there's another character named Mike Moses, who's the president of the company, and if if Richard Branson is the um, flamboyant, uh, you know, sort of, you know, like I said, swashbuckling uh, figurehead of, of, of Virgin Galactic. Mike Moses is the guy who keeps the trains running on time. And Moses, um, I cannot express how much time, it sort of express my gratitude and also uh, uh, articulate how much time and patience he, he, he took explaining to me relatively technical things over and over and over again so that I would be fluent enough to be able to ask the right questions. Uh, and, and, you know, Moses was just also kind of a throwback character. You know, he had, the first time I met him, you know, he had uh, this sort of Apollo-like haircut, you know, with, with you know, short on top, little, little flat top, and um, speaks a mile a minute. You know, it, he, it, it was, if I've recorded all of these interviews. I, I sat in on all these meetings. I've recorded all these interviews. I, I just, I have this pen that records uh, on the special dimpled paper. And um, so I could just be sort of writing and capturing all this audio and then I'd go home and try and make sense of it. And good thing, because otherwise I would have gotten none of this because Mike would just, he would just go off on these long 12 minute tangents about rocket technology. And I'd have to be, <laughs> and so I could go back the next day. I'd, I'd come in, I'd say, listen, I went back and listened to that thing you said yesterday. And I had to pause it and start it at least 25 times, but I think I get it enough now. So, so Mike uh, is also, is, is the, is the, in some ways sort of the, the, the heartbeat of the company. I mean, he really does kind of keep things, keep things moving. There is this other character, there's another test pilot, and this is the test pilot who lost, his, who was killed in 2014. And his name is Mike Alsbury. And I had an opportunity to spend some time with, with his, with his wife, his widow. And I mean, that story just, she 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 spoke to me and then she was reluctant to speak and and you know i i have not spoken to her to, to get a sense of how she um you know what she thinks of the book but uh i just found her story so moving and affecting I mean, she that morning the, she and mike decided that uh this was most likely going to be mike's last opportunity to fly the spaceship and they wanted their kids to see their dad flying the spaceship so the kids were there on the flight line that day and the accident happens and then they have to you know rush the kids home so the kids you know so who knows what they're going to see and and her emotional journey was just incredibly stirring she didn't return to mojave during the daytime i mean she lives in tehachapi which is a town about 30 minutes from mojave in which like the most direct route to get from Tehachapi to anywhere is driving through Mojave. She spends the next three years taking the long road. She doesn't want to drive through Mojave. She doesn't, you know, she just can't sort of bear to, to, to relive that. First time she goes is when Mark Stuckey and his wife uh, take her to the crash site for the first time. And they go to the crash site and, you know, because it's the desert and the winds are constantly moving around, there's stuff you, you're, they're finding, they're still finding stuff. Even now, years on, they're still finding uh, uh, pieces of, of, of uh, debris from the crash. And they are walking around that day, the crash site, and they find, um, they find a piece of debris. And, you know, Stucky describing watching Michelle pick up this piece of debris and just hold it to her chest. Right. And, and, you know, she starts shuddering with tears and, you know, the, 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 the strength to be able to kind of carry on and the way that the test pilot community came around and circled her to support her test pilots who didn't even know Mike at all. And, you know, to kind of, to, to, to bring this around, I, uh, Mike was finally in January of, uh, last year, his name was added to the Space Mirror, the, the astronaut memorial uh, in Florida. And 
I was there and watched, you know, them pull the black cloth off and Mike Galsbury's name is up there as the first private astronaut on that wall. And um, man, I mean, just to feel her sort of pain and her and to watch her and, and to see her strength through all of this was also really, really quite powerful. Um, so I want to turn over the last question to Dr. Litback. Take it away. Well, thanks, Nick, and thanks, Meg. This is a wonderful conversation. Um, I grew up uh, in the heyday of the space program, the Apollo program, and I recall a stat from that time that if for the Saturn V, that if 99.99% of all the parts worked, that would mean that 5,000 parts had not worked, okay? And so it's conveyed in your title, Matt, uh, Nick, test gods, that these are experimental programs. And we're moving from like a test program into kind of routinizing it, space tourism, et cetera. And I think what gets lost, at least uh, in my reptilian brain here is that how dangerous this is. You know, it's still, these are experimental uh, programs and it's conveyed by the group of people that do this type of work. Um, if anyone should get a, a, a comp on a ticket on Virgin Galactic, um, it should be you after all the work that you've done. But the question, my question is, would your wife allow you to get on that? Okay, given all the risk. That's question one. And question two um, is uh, uh, about the role of, of the private sector in all of this exploration. As also being a sci-fi aficionado, I recall that in the movie Aliens, there's always this like, there's this corporation that is running all of these things. And it's the corporation that says, return alien, all other condition, all other, all other uh, factors, ex crew expendable, you know? And I, it sort of made an impression on me. So could you just talk about, because we think of big science projects as like Manhattan, it's government that does it. Now you have the private sector and maybe the private sector will help us like find kind of a silver silver bullet on carbon uh, uh, capture and, and, and dealing with atmospheric carbon. So if you could deal with those, first question is the risk piece and routinizing of space travel. And the second is like what the role of, of the private sector in this venture portends for uh, maybe that verb uh, is, is a leading verb in this respect for the future. So let me let me take the second question first, and let me sort of try and take a version of the second question, um, which is in some ways the 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 perils and the hazards of having the private sector so central to this undertaking. Um, there was a lot of resistance inside of Virgin Galactic after the magazine piece came out as to whether or not to continue to cooperate with me and to to let me uh, to to let me continue to embed with the company as I wrote the book, and the concern that was raised. And this is, I think, this is the concern that one has when it's a private enterprise that, that's running the show. The concern they had was um, Nick makes it sound really dangerous and we are still trying to sell tickets and we want to be telling stories that are about our um, corporate relationships and sponsorships with uh, Land Rover and not telling stories about how death defying this all is. That right there, in some ways, addresses, I think, your second question, which is like, this is when, when those priorities, uh, when, when, when those corporate priorities are so, um, at, are so prominent and so, uh, in fact, are so prominently in, in corporate decision making, that the, the, the portrayal of the glitz and the glamour of the venture is overtaking the real risk of it, is when... Um, uh, is a serious concern, I think. Getting back to your first question, would my wife allow me to do it? Let's, <laughs> it's, you know, she's, she's downstairs right now. I'm in London. She's downstairs making dinner right now. So we're, we're a few hours ahead of you guys. I'm not sure that I should bring her up and ask that question because I'm not sure I would want to know the answer. But I will, an I, will, I will answer as to whether I would go because I think my own, my own thoughts on this have changed. If you would have asked me in August of 2018 uh, whether I would go, I had just finished. I was I was sort of still you know embedding and finishing the magazine piece. I was spending all of this time with them. I was there all the time. I saw the way that they worked through problems. Um, I would I would have I would have gone in a heartbeat. Um, if you ask me now, uh, I know that they the February 2019 flight, which was their last space flight. Uh, when they landed, they, well, they've not flown since February 2019 because they noticed 
that after that flight, effectively the spaceship had come apart. The glue that holds a piece of the, the, the trailing edge of the horizontal stabilizer, which is the, the flight service that controls the aircraft at supersonic speeds, had come undone. The glue had, the glue had come undone. So they've not flown since then. And so I, I've sort of questions about how they've addressed that. The vice president of safety has resigned, uh, resigned after that uh, because of his safety concern, because of concerns about the safety pro of the program. And um, I'm not around them anymore. And what I realized, I, I, I wrote a piece a few weeks ago, about a week ago for the Washington Post about this. Um, I talked to a sociologist to try and see, help have her help me understand why I, I said, I said, if I just become a wimp or like what, what, what changed here? And she said, no, she said, there's this, there's this interesting phenomenon. This is the sort of wisdom of the crowd. She said, you spent so much time with those test pilots that you inherently kind of absorb their risk calculation. Um, you know, we do this, I think wherever, you know, I think about, I was skiing in Chamonix last year, uh, right before the lockdown and by the last day of that trip, if you would have told me that we were going to go ski some insane sort of, you know, avalanche and, you know, prone area, I would have said, well, with the right guys, I'll go do it. Now, you know, I spent the last year locked in my office. <laughs> I haven't gone outside. I see people on the sidewalk and I cover my mouth. You know, we've all become so hidebound that all of our risk calculations have, 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 all of our kind of risk assessment has been dialed way back. If you were to tell me, oh, hey, you can go to Chamonix and go hella skiing tomorrow, my God, I'd be terrified. And so I think that um, I, I, am, I am less uh, prepared to go on a flight now, but that could all change. Like give, give us a summer of traveling again and things think could begin to change or give me uh, an opportunity to fly on a SpaceX rocket. I think that would change or show or have, have Virgin Galactic complete a couple of successful test flights that don't have any issues and that are showing that they can do it safely and, and confidently. And I think that could change too. But, but at this moment, um, you know, I'll take a periodic sun, bit of sunshine and uh, my, my office here at home. And just one last comment for your kids, Nick. Just please tell them that it's as hard to become a staff writer at the New Yorker as it is to become a NASA pilot, probably, in terms of, <laughs> of, of odds. So that'll impress them. <laughs> Thanks. 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 Thanks, Nick Schmidl. The book is Test Gods. It's out now. Go grab a copy, and we'll talk with you soon. Thanks so Thanks much. Thanks a bunch. Thanks so much for having me on, guys. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you.